Hello there everyone, it's me again of course, John Doe, here to do a final end of the year Ghost Letters report. Now this is the first time I've actually done one of these. You know, end of the year, make one final video to kind of wrap up and reflect a little bit on everything that's happened in the past year. Now the reason I'm doing this is because, you know, I think that at this point it is good to reflect and to think about what's happened and of course where we might be going as 2014 approaches us. Now, the year 2013 here in Japan has been um, interesting, to say the least. We experienced the first year of um, the fascist, at this point, Shinzo Abe's Abinomics, which, as far as I can tell, and a lot of other people here in Japan, us average people, you know, us average working people, have not felt any benefits of Abinomics at all. The only people who seem to be benefiting from it are very large corporations, uh, people, big time investors in the stock market, and bankers. So, Abinomics appears to me to be all about benefiting the capitalist class and really not about the people here. The one thing that it may end up helping us is with deflation. Now, defla deflation recently finally stopped in Japan. Inflation is sure it's surely to kick in, which means an increase in price, the price index. But the one thing that everyone keeps pointing out to Shinzo Abe, and he doesn't want to listen, is the fact that if you stop deinflation, that's good. All right, but when you start having some inflation, people's income are going to have to match that. Now, incomes in Japan have been decreasing. Just in, the, just in the six years I've been living here, I've experienced it. A lot of people I know have experienced it. And that's natural when deflation keeps happening and the price index keeps going down. But he's not considering this counter effect of inflation. Is that majority of people's salaries, monthly salaries or income, must increase to match the inflation. Now, some people, high ranking officials within the bourgeois government, have tried to point this out to Abe, but he's not listening. Instead, Abe, I remember a few times Abe did mention that he encouraged companies to give pay raises to their employees. But you can't force that through. You see, that's the limitation in a capitalist system. That even if a politician does, on a rare occasion want to promote something that's actually going to benefit us, the people, he cannot make that happen without the agreement of a capitalist. And there's no way you can expect a capitalist to increase wages without a fight. And that is where, of course, organized labor comes into play because as this inflation happens and as these coming changes to labor law that a lot of 
big businesses and companies are pushing for, we're going to start to see a serious problem with balancing the economy. It's when people don't are not making enough money overall to support the inflation. You're going to see a smaller minority of people having to do most of the consumer buying. So, either there's going to have to be a lot more luxury items sold, or hope that the minority capitalist class that owns majority of the wealth will buy more average daily things at a higher price. Because us, you know, the average worker, working class, we're not going to be able to keep up with this. There's no way we can spend enough to keep up with this, the, type of, the type of inflation that's going to be coming. So on the economic front, you know, we have that that happened this year in Japan. You know, Abinomics not really benefiting people as it was promoted. But like I say, you know, a lot of things have happened here in Japan. Now, we all remember Mr. Um, Hashimoto from Osaka and his just outlandish statements concerning uh, wartime sex slaves in, in, in Japan. Now, I know that a lot of the Japanese right wing don't like to hear this and they don't like to face this or deal with it. And Hashimoto was pandering to that group, that sector of society that denies anything that would be a negative from the outside world looking at Japan. And Hashimoto completely denied that any sex waves were ever, ever happened. You know, the, the, the Imperial Army would never would have would have never done such a thing in fact you know he claims that the army paid these women or they went through pimps and the pimps paid the women so there was compensation so it's not slavery really of course you know part of my english here but he's full of shit and majority of people in the world know this that got, that got him in a lot of hot water. Did not help his uh, Japan Restoration Party, which is a um, not particularly fascist in nature, to to be enough to be called fascist, but very much far right. And they lost a lot of um, seats across the country, but they they still still have been able to hold on to their strong base and. Um, Osaka and the surrounding areas, and they still have a, they still have a large but minority presence in the national government, and, and in Tokyo they were demolished in the in the city elections. So Hashimoto is still around; he's still there. Uh, recently, Abe said he wants to talk with Hashimoto about potentially forming a. Um, coalition adding to the LDP's current majority coalition which would give them a super majority if they were to get such a large opposition bourgeois party to join them it's key that, that he needs that while we're on the subject of Hashimoto and his Japan restoration party it's key that Abe gets that coalition He's going to be working on it for a while. And if he's able to get it, that supermajority would allow him to push through some serious changes to the Japanese constitution. There's many things he wants to change. Uh, complete one, for one, completely removing any mention of fundamental human rights and creating a constitution where the citizen, the citizen's duty to the nation supersedes their own individuality and their own humanity. Yeah. 
But the one, though, I've focused on is the Article 9. Article 9 basically for, forbids Japan from having a, a military. It effectively renounces war. But Japan does have a military. It's called the Special Defense Force. It's been around ever since post-World War II. But it can't... It's limited because of the the way Article 9 is written and the, and the intent of Article 9. Abe wants to completely remove Article 9. I, like I've suggested, he's going to do it in a very keen way. He's going to reword it. He's going to try getting the idea of collective defense. Which, collective defense means, you know, you can jump into another country's fight. But you know how modern geopolitical politics work. It's just a way to get around saying that Japan has a, a full-on military. So he'll, he'll do that. He'll try to sneak it in that way. So we have that, you know, the rise and continuing influence of the far right here in Japan. You know, the street protesters of the far right wingers, many different groups. I did do one video where I actually went to a far right protest or a rally or whatever they want to call it. Filmed it with the, um, the one particular group I focused on were the ones that are very anti-Korean. And they are wartime sex slave deniers. Yeah, that was interesting to be around that gang for a few hours. The far right is rising in, in power and influence here. and You know, they had attempts to ban books. Particularly the book, um, folk, in the video I made in the past few months about that. It's basically a book that, that in no uncertain terms, it's a manga, that shows the horrors of war, especially nuclear war. Tells a story of a, of a, of a young man, a boy, a young man, going through that experience and living it. And they tried to ban that. I did get a little bit of update on that. I did make a, I did not make a video to update that that particular issue, but apparently the, um, they stopped the ban out of um, public uh, pushback against the ban. So that was a positive, one of the positive things that did that did happen this year here in Japan. And of course, you know, we cannot speak about Japan without mentioning Fukushima, right? Fukushima is still just out of control. We had the problem of massive contaminated water leaks into the ocean and TEPCO came out and admitted that, you know, hundreds upon hundreds of tons of radioactive water is flowing into the ocean every day. We had continued leaks they could not get under control. They fixed one leak in a, in a storage tanks they currently have for the contaminated water. Another one would spring up just as quickly. And then information came out later about why that was happening. You know, apparently these storage tanks were very poorly made by labor that was not skilled in making those type of storage tanks. Which and then you know later it came out. That's something I've been touched on a long time back, but it took a while for an investigative journalist to be able to get in there. But, you know, it's come out that, you know, the reason you have this type of labor at Fukushima is due to Yakuza involvement and these subcontracted, contracted hiring agencies. It's, it goes on in a lot of industries in Japan. Just With Fukushima, it's ridiculous that they're doing that. It's where the person who hires you is not the person who manages you. It goes on a lot here in Japan. And unfortunately, we have the Atomic Mafia, which is, you know, Yakuza involvement in the hiring of labor in the nuclear power industry in Japan. And with Fukushima, it just finally got exposed. So we had that going on. You know, why work is so poor quality up there and also you know continuing of radiation everywhere all over the all over the planet and half half brain schemes to kind of fix certain problems you know the ice wall that was a real interesting idea 
I actually think they're going to try to do that one. They have to do something. And then, you know, you have the um, water purification process that the, they tried. They kickstarted that one up. They found out all the material, all the equipment they had was in very poor condition due to lack of maintenance and safety standards. Again, keeps coming up when we talk about nuclear energy and related to, to Fukushima. So they, they tried to filter some of the radioactive water for a for a future release of that water into the ocean, but they couldn't do that because continu continuous problems, like I said, with maintenance and safety revolving that, so they had to shut that back down. And they're going to have to rebuild that entire system basically from the ground up. And maybe they can try that again, but of course, you know, how can you really get all radiation out of contaminated water? It seems kind of ridiculous to me, but that will be something we'll probably see come up again in 2014. Yeah. And also, we do remember the very recent move by the fascist Shinzo Abe to come up with this state secrets bill. Something that's been in the works for quite some time. It finally came up for um, a vote to get, become into law. And it was railroaded through. LDP had a majority. Which means they, they could not be stopped. On passage of legislation. They can, they can control the entire process of debate. Everything. And the opposition. The bourgeois opposition political parties. Just lost it. You know, they, they wanted their power, they wanted their say-so in it, and also, you know, they really saw that this would be very damaging to society, and could potentially cause a lot of social unrest, which it did during uh, some of the protests that were going on around that time. Unfortunately, I didn't get around to get all the filming for all the things that was going on, but, you know, I'm not the only one who's so-called boots on the ground. At these at those protests, and then I got also photos, and got reports from people on the ground there, and it was, yeah, police were harassing people. We saw arrest. We saw a bit of violence. But the law, you know, was passed, and now it's codified. And it will fully be enforced come fall 2014, which is the plan. So it's passive law. It's passed as law. Excuse me. And it's, but it's not fully being enforced. It's parts of it, which we don't even know all the parts of it. But some of it's being enforced immediately with, you know, gag orders. And the full brunt of this state secrets law is planned to come out, come at us, like I said, fall 2014. So, as we go through 2014, we'll see just how far things are pushed with getting, getting information, access to what's going on, the public's right to know what their government is up to, and we'll see if any journalists or citizens get arrested for what is called um, acquiring information inappropriately. We'll see how that goes as we head into the new year. So those are just, you know, a few of the things that have been, have been going on this year. But, like I said, this is a video for reflection. And the way I see things... Overall, here in Japan, coming up is the closer we get to the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, the more intense things are going to become, and the tighter the government's going to want to grip its power. So, all these things you see cooking up right now are going to progress. 
in the next few years and I don't think it's going to be very pretty because this 2020 Olympics is a chance for these capitalists here, here in Japan and the bourgeois in general to show that they have everything under control that Japan will be competitive that is worth investing in Japan Fukushima is not a problem. Our society is completely disciplined and ordered. We have no dissent here. You know. And labor, well, labor just does whatever the hell we say. That's the type of things, you know, that we're facing as we lead up to 2020. And I'm not sure how it's all going to play out here you know it Abe's playing a balancing game right now the whole government in general you know they're trying to balance dealing with serious environmental issues rising discontent among labor and more irregular workers more unemployed people more people working on um, zero-hour contracts or non-guaranteed contracts. Trying to balance, you know, the environmental things of problems going on with people being able to make, make money to live with the need to expand Japan's market and expand their political economy. And he's making political moves. He's trying to get people on his side as much. He really needs a super majority in the parliament to, so he can do whatever he wants. He's still a, a bit limited in what he can get away with. So we're going to see a lot of political maneuvering. At least, at least I can say that. You'll see a lot of political maneuvering. You'll see a lot of moves being made. You'll see, again, that gradual process. Yeah. But I would like to mention something positive that happened this year. As Abe claimed, they were going to restart nuclear reactors this year. That did not happen. At all. Couldn't do it. I guess, you know, he thought he could just go in there and do some maneuvering and make it happen. But couldn't. Couldn't do it. You know, it took him a while to purge the um, Energy Policy Board to get so called experts on that board who would agree with him and says that, you know, nuclear power is a fundamental important part of Japan's energy policy. And before that Energy Committee, when it had the original members on it, clearly stated we have to get rid of nuclear power. We have to get rid of it. We got to phase it out. Not after Fukushima. Not after this. This is not going to work. The people don't want it. And we see that it's a dangerous form of energy. You know, like, like Einstein said. That's one hell of a way to boil water. To make steam. You know. So... But 2014, I think we're going to see a serious effort to restart reactors here in Japan. Because now he has that energy policy board saying, yes, we need nuclear. They've started up the process, but it got rather delayed. But they have started that process that started later in the year in 2013 of having these nuclear power companies, these utilities, start to apply for nuclear restarts. It's an interesting little um, system they've set up. After they re released the Abe version of nuclear safety standards for Japan, he said that, okay, any company that wishes to restart the reactors, apply for restart permission, and if you pass the safety standards, we'll restart them. And TEPCO... And several other companies applied. Immediately. 
But it come to find out that they're not exactly ready for inspections at all. And more, you know, dumbfoundedly stupid things come out about how TEPCO is running things at Fukushima, and that's also delayed this restart process. But you're going to see in 2014, they're, they're going to really try. Really put a big push. If they don't get it done in 2014, I'd say at least by 2018, they're going to be wanting this. So it's all gradual. It's all gradual. Build and build and build and build and build. So it's important to keep an eye on things like that. You know, a lot of times people can be guilty of waiting until it's too late. Not keeping an eye on things. Not watching how things build and progress. Sometimes slowly, but it does build and progress. And that's what I've watched here in Japan. I watch things build. It gets gradual. How things are done in Japan can seem a bit slow. But once it builds up to the point to where something can happen, it'll, it explodes. And everybody looks and says, oh, what was going on? How, where'd this come from? Well, it, it was there for years. It just took time. You know, we look at the political situation in Japan. We have the far right running amok. And we have fascist leadership. Straight up fascist leadership. Yeah. And these things, you know, are, are not something that happened overnight. It builds. It builds. And then it, boom. You see it happen. Yeah. So 2014 should be an interesting year. For us here in Japan. And inter interesting for the world in general as we move forward. And the, uh, the issues I brought up and many others, you know, that I'm not bringing up here. So, you know, I want to do, wanted to do an extended video. Just as, just as a little wrap up. You know, lots and lots of videos I did this year. When I think about it. Still was able to do a fair amount of protest vids, you know. We had the um, anti imperialist war against Syria which I actually had a chance to speak at that, that was interesting and that global protest movement did have some effect apparently you know it, it prevented that war that invasion so that was a, a success you know um, I looked at a bit more social side of things in Japan a few times this year which is important to look at. You, know, you should check out the social alienation video. You find that interesting. You know, and TEPCO has come out and kept admitting, admitting more and more things as things come out in the wash. That was, at one point, you know, relieving that they would be honest about a few things, but at the same time, when it does come out, it makes you see that the situation is worse than you previously thought. Yeah. So yeah. 2014 if all these issues are going to be interesting moving forward. I predict them to get more intense. I predict them, you know, they get a bit darker before it gets lighter. But this channel, you know, can be awful serious at times. And, you know, I don't really talk about daily life here in Japan and the goodness that is Japanese society. That's something that, you know, a lot of people would be upset if I spoke about. But I'm going to speak about it a little bit. You know, the average Japanese person is all right. They're not bad. Not bad people at all. They can be very surprisingly helpful. 
You'd be surprised what a simple smile and a little politeness will get you in this country. Daily things, small things, like um, opening the door for someone, smiling, saying thank you, saying I'm sorry, saying please. People really react to that. And they'll help you out a lot here. You know, they'll do what they can. If they see that you're not fucked up, basically. Because there's a lot of odd, odd people we'll run into in Japan, especially living in Tokyo metro area. It's, you know, sometimes make you want to go crazy. You know, so, you know, the people here, I keep saying, don't blame Japanese people. That's a mistake. That doesn't help things. That puts this society on the defensive. It's a part of the mindset here. When I get, when I see a lot of heavy criticism coming from the outside world, not everyone here, but a majority of people here, will become defensive rather quickly. These grand sweeping statements like, you know, Japan's an evil country. You know, the Japanese cannot be trusted. Or, you know, Japanese are play dirty pool. It's common, you know, that people say those things. But when you say those things, that has an effect on the average people here. And it is a defensive reaction they'll have. They'll fall right back on right-wing thinking and get very stubborn and be and can be very difficult to talk to at times. Trust me, I've been there. I've had those conversations. You know, It can be difficult. You have to learn how to say things in a certain way. So if you want to criticize the culture here, I would advise, you know, to not be harsh. Because, you know, when you talk about economic things or political things, and, and of course Fukushima, you can be more blunt. But when you talk about the society or the culture here, that hits people personally. You know, it makes them feel responsible for it. Because, you know, people in Japan often feel rather deeply connected to their own society. In a an image wise at least you know the reality of it is much different you know the idea of japan is still a big thing here people take a certain pride in being japanese you know japan being a, a country now i know it, it's all just um useless nationalism and it's a way for capitalists and bourgeois to control people but you have to know they're in they're in the people here in that they don't have that class consciousness so it's important to try to teach them break it but you can't be really harsh because they don't react well to it it's a pride thing i guess but um, this, this video is starting to get rather long here even though I wanted it to be extended so I'll go ahead and wrap up by saying you know that yeah 2014 is going to be a bit rough guys comrades sisters but I don't think the world is going to end next year we have a tough fight ahead of us but I think if we keep trucking on Keep doing what we think is the right thing to do. Keep doing what we can do as each person for this big idea that every one of us is fighting for. We can achieve things that would surprise you. So don't give up. I won't tell you to have faith. I will tell you don't give up. We can do this. Yes, we can do this. And with Japanese people, I think 2014 should be a year 
to show a bit more love and empathy and understanding of the people here themselves and back off a bit on the harshness tone it down a little things that me and you can see doesn't particularly mean the average people here can see and that does not make us better than them do not ever put that in your mind it just means that you gotta help people to see what you see so yeah 2014 let's try to tone down the harshness of attacking Japanese people and blaming them for everything because you you do realize they're not in control of this country the people here are not in control of things and I'll leave you with that so enjoy the new year celebrations and after that gear up for another year of the Ghost Layers Report with me John Dole if it's the first video you've ever seen of mine now will be a good time to subscribe there will be a little thing here you can do that so this is me in 2013 checking out